All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back, everybody. This is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we're going to do yet again a new sutra. Uh, tonight the sutra is the Soma Sutra or the Soma Sutta. Uh, it's once again, it's coming to us from the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to tonight. I'm really looking forward to teaching this sutra. This is one of those situations where I'm really grateful to you all and to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, because I don't know if like I ever really would have found this sutra had it not been sort of for this, this Sunday night sutra study. So I'm very appreciative. Again, I don't, I don't know who's the giver and who's the recipient of all these gifts on Sunday nights, uh, but I feel like it was a great gift to be able to find this sutra. So let me kind of introduce it. As you know, for the last couple of Sundays, we've been sort of just mm, kind of just noodling our way through the Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, we started with the sutra pretty deep in it. And then I went to the beginning of the collection. And then uh, probably last week or whenever it was, I was flipping through the Samyutta Nikaya looking for a good sutra for Sunday night. And I discovered chapter five. So the Samyutta Nikaya is divided into chapters. I forget exactly how many. And the fifth chapter, the fifth kind of collection of suttas is the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, the collection of sutras on the nuns, the Bhikkhunis. I did not know there was a Bhikkhuni Samyutta. I did not know there was a collection of sutras from the nuns. Pretty recently, I discovered the collection of poems by the nuns known as the Therigatha. And I've done a couple of Dharma doors where we've read poems from here. When I discovered this, I was excited. I didn't know that there was a collection of ancient poems by Buddhist nuns. In fact, as far as I read, because I found, by the way, this is a good book, The First Buddhist Women, and this is a study and a translation of, a, of this book, the collection of poems. So if you want a study of it, in addition to a translation, this is a good reference book. Um, but I was really drawn to these poems because I didn't know they existed. So I got really into them and I've taught from them a few times, but little did I know again, that there was a collection of actual sutras. And that's different than a gatha. Although tonight we're gonna do a little bit of exploring because what we're gonna notice is that there's an actually an, a lot of overlap between the fairy gatha and the poems or the sutras that we're going to look at tonight. So in the Samyutta Nikaya, chapter five, the bhikkhunis, there's 10 little sutras. I want to focus tonight on the second of the 10, which is the Soma. So the nun or the bhikkhuni is called Soma. That's her name. I want to focus on her sutra tonight, but we are, or I will, be reading from the very first sutta. So that's going to be the Alavika Sutta. So that's a different nun. There's a reason why I want to read both of those. Um, we'll get into that in a second. But here's one thing to note. As I already mentioned, this is chapter five of this. If you go back one section, if you go back one chapter to chapter four, that is a collection of sutras that is called the Mara Samyutta, the collection of sutras about Mara, the evil one. And what I think is interesting about the way these sutras are gathered together is that it 
it, I can see why they put the Bhikkhuni suttas after the Mara suttas. And that's because seemingly all 10 of these uh, sutras that each are dedicated or they are actually each about a different nun, but the circumstances of each of the sutras is the same, which is that each of these nuns gets sort of, um, well, you could call it taunted by Mara. They get sort of, um, yeah, they basically either get like Mara tries to scare them <laughs> out of practice. And so there's this connection between Mara and these 10 sutras. And probably that's why it's kind of appears after the Mara section. So even before we dive into these, yeah, even before I, re I read a word, I want to make a kind of a couple statements about Mara since Mara is going to appear. So you may or may not know, of course, that Mara is like the bad guy in Buddhism. Like that's, this is the being that the Buddha defeats under the Bodhi tree. Um, this is like the personification of evil in Buddhism. Now, what's helpful to know is that the word Mara <laughs> means death. So Mara, the being, is pretty clear, clearly a kind of personification of death. Technically, I think it's a zoomorphication of death because Mara is usually a creature of some sort, not a god or a human or even a like a anthropomorphized being, but he's kind of a creature. But here's the thing about Buddhism. I, th I really feel strongly that it, when we look at these collections of poems, each of these nuns gets kind of tempted or taunted by Mara in a different way. And so I guess if you want to read it literally, <laughs> I guess Mara the devil <laughs> appeared 10 times each in the same place to the, these women. So you could read these stories literally, or you could read them figuratively, which of course is how I read sutras. Everybody that comes to Dharma doors knows I read all sutras allegorically in that way. And I think that it's pretty clear here that we are not to understand Mara as a being. Mara is doubt. Mara is this sort of the fear of death that we all have. That's Mara. And that's very real. <laughs> fear of dying is very real. And it and it it goads us into a lot of behavior. And that's the idea of Mara. Mara is a, a, a goader prodding us into all kinds of behavior. So I think there's a way that we can speak kind of in a Buddhist way in saying that Mara neither exists nor doesn't exist. Like there really is such a thing as the fear of dying, but there may not be a being called Mara. So just wanted to make that clear before we even dive into these, that I'm not under the impression that the devil came and visited these 10 women in that way. Okay, so that's just something to say about that. The next thing I want to say before, again, before we even read these, I think it's really important that you know that all 10 of these nuns are considered arahats, fully enlightened beings according to the early Buddhist path. That is important to mention for a number of reasons. So the first and main reason is, is that there is kind of an understanding or a popular understanding that a woman, a female, cannot become an arhat, that they must somehow, in a way, first 
get reborn as a man and become an arhat. But that's not true at all. In fact, I think that's misconstruing or conflating the Mahayana idea that you sometimes find, which is that a female cannot become a Buddha. And I think that that idea, which is, has its problems and there's different ways to understand that, but I think that that idea gets conflated or again, kind of thrown back onto the Hinayana idea and, and then gets kind of misunderstood as, oh, and women can't be arahats. All evidence to the contrary. All 10 of these women are arahats. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because these are sutras. And when it comes to Buddhism, sutras, the suttas, as they are called in the Pali, these are sacred texts. These are sacred literature. Poems, this is sort of, you know, art, you know, almost in a way. Sutras are considered the words of the Buddha, even though, as we are going to see, the Buddha doesn't even appear in these. But the Buddha actually doesn't always appear in suttas, because sometimes it'll be Shariputra, also an arhat, who delivers the teachings. Or sometimes it's Madhuryayana. So there's a precedent in sutras of having people other than the Buddha teach. But what's really interesting about these is that it's going to be words that are coming from female arhats. So I just kind of want to emphasize that too, that uh, we should really uh, uh, consider it important that these 10 stories or these 10 accounts have been preserved in that way. So, um, and once again, we have Pali versions of these 10 stories or 10 sutras, and we have Chinese versions of these 10 sutras. So we have a lot of different versions to compare and contrast. But let's go ahead and get into this because like I said, I do wanna read the first of these before we get to Soma. So I'm on page 221 of the big book. If you happen to have the wisdom publication version, Otherwise, there's a link in the chat to, uh, I think tonight we're using, or I gave everybody the link to the Sutta Central version of this sutra. Sutta Central, by the way, is an awesome resource for the Pali Canon, if you don't know about it. So, all right. So, yeah, let me, let's just go ahead and read. This first sutta is called the Alavika Sutta. So Alavika is one of the bhikshunis, one of the bhikkhunis, one of the nuns. And here's how the sutra reads. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savasti in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. Then in the morning, the bhikkhuni Alavika, dressed and taking bowl and robe, entered Savasti for alms. When she had walked for alms in Shravasti and had returned from her alms round, after her meal, she went to the blind man's grove, seeking seclusion. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, and trepidation and terror in the bhikkhuni Alavika, desiring to make her fall away from seclusion, approached her and addressed her in verse, saying, there is no escape from the world. So what will you do with seclusion? Enjoy the delights of sensual pleasures. Don't be remorseful later. <clears throat> <laughs> so, <clears throat> sound familiar? <laughs> it's why I wanted to start with this one tonight, because this is kind of a connection with last week. So this is exactly the same kind of idea that was presented last week to the monk Samidhi. 
So Samidhi last week was challenged with this idea of like, why give up the delights of the world when you're so young? Why not live a little first? So the exact kind of idea is being presented to Alavika. Um, by the way, really quickly, before we get to Alavika's beautiful answer, because the next sutra is also going to take place there, a quick word about the blind man's grove. <laughs> So I was actually reading a whole like article or like a mini article, like an essay on the blind man's grove. It's a place, it's a, a, a grove, a kind of a vihara, not exactly a vihara, but a, an aranya, a kind of a forest dwelling place. And well, there's a little bit of debate about exactly what this means because blind man's grove can also be translated as just dark the dark woods is another translation or the dark grove and um i don't want to get too into it i think it's just an interesting setting for these sutras to take place there seems to be at least according to the essay i was reading there seems to be a relationship between kind of the supernatural and the dark or the blind men's grove. So maybe it's because Mara is visiting the nuns. That's why it's sort of taking place in the dark woods. We don't know, but just wanted to kind of point out this strange auspicious place where these take, where the poet, where the sutra takes place. All right. So after Mara taunts the nun with this poem about there not being any escape from the world, so just stay and enjoy yourself, then it occurred to the bhikkhuni Alavika. Now, who is it that recited this verse? A human being or a non-human being? Then it occurred to her, this is Mara, the evil one who has recited this verse desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in me, desiring to make me fall away from seclusion. Then the bhikkhuni Alavika, having understood, said this, this is Mara the evil one, and replied to him in verse. There is an escape from the world, which I have closely touched with pranya wisdom. O evil one, kinsman of the negligent, you do not know that state. Sensual pleasures are like swords and stakes, the aggregates like the chopping block. What you call sensual delight has become for me non-delight. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing oh, the bhikkhuni Alavika knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. <laughs> okay, so that's actually, um, as, as we're going to see in the next sutta with Soma, they dispense, they, they, were, they will dispense with the introduction. And so I just want you to know that there's a way in which there's just a formula for the sutra. And I wanted to read you the full formula by reading you the Alavika Sutta so that you can kind of hear the way the whole sutta sort of is structured in that way. So yeah, no, please. Thank you. Uh... I just I'm just struck by Dante's Inferno hmm. in the opening of Dante's Inferno through a wood darkly absolutely hmm. uh, and and uh, Pilgrim's Progress a few others so it's fun to find the re the source of some of this stuff thank you great insight <clears throat> okay so once again we have sort of the same kind of theme as last week which is this idea of like, no, while you're here, live it up. And then the nun, our Alavika, 
she says, no, 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 there is an escape from the world, which I have closely touched with wisdom. And I do want you to know that the term there is pranya. It's panya because it's in Pali, but it's the same idea of pranya. And again, that is a, a pointer or an indicator that alavika is an arahat because pranya is sort of a, a quality of an arhat in that way. And then what she says is, but you, Mara, you don't know about, you don't know about that state. You, because you're, that your domain is the world in that sense. And then this idea of hers, that sensual pleasures are like swords and stakes and the aggregates are like their chopping block. What you call sensual delight has become for me non-delight. So <clears throat> I do want to just dwell for a, just a second. So as you know, or I hope you know, the early Buddhist tradition that you find in the Pali Canon, that you find it in these Pali suttas, this, these suttas, this is about the renunciatory path, right? And so I want to remind you that the renunciatory path is a little more kind of hardcore in a certain way. And so what, what I mean by that is, is that early Buddhism, the kind of Buddhism represented by these kinds of suttas, early Buddhism takes a slightly harder look at being alive. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is that there is a way in which in early Buddhism, as Alav Alavika tells us, sensual pleasures, they're not just kind of neutral in early Buddhism, but they are actually sort of anti-pleasure. This kind of goes along with a general sentiment that early Buddhism has too, which is the early Buddhist view of the body is that it is to be viewed as disgusting. It is to be viewed as a corpse full of pus, utterly unattractive. It's one of the reasons why I don't actually always teach the Hinayana stuff in the early suttas because the Mahayana stuff that I normally teach has a very different attitude about the body in that way. And what I mean is, is that for the Mahayana tradition, to view the body as disgusting is just as problematic as viewing it as beautiful and wonderful. It's this, just the same problem, but from a different direction. So the Mahayana goes for more of that I would say that upekshik, equanimous, neutral kind of zone, whereas early Buddhism is much more about developing a distaste for the world, a distaste for the pleasures of the world, a distaste for the body, certainly a distaste for sexuality, and all of that. So that sort of is what Alavika is talking about in terms of an escape from the world. An escape from the world is by developing this distaste for it. That is a, a surefire way to escape it in that sense. So any questions about Alavika's poem before I get to Soma, who's sort of, a, you know, the main sutta for tonight? Again, that was sort of more of just like an appetizer in that sense to get us going. All right, so to Soma. So as far as I can tell, or as far as my research could provide, the name Soma is related to Soma. So, and you might know of Soma as this sort of mysterious Indian ambrosia, a kind of mysterious Indian maybe a psychedelic drug, maybe a panacea, an all-curing, all-healing medicine. But that's 
Soma, S-O-M-A, but a short A. Our nun, her name is Soma with a long A at the end. And from what I can tell, Soma is the name of a medicinal herb that is related to Soma. So there does seem to be an etymological relationship there. I couldn't get any deeper with Soma, like the meaning of it. It just kept pointing to this herb. So there's that. But here we have. So of course, this is just going to say at Shravasti, but it could be thus have I heard one time and so on. But then in the morning, the Bikuni Soma, dressed and taking bowl and robe, entered Shravasti for alms. When she had walked for alms in Shravasti and returned from her alms round, after her meal, she went to the blind men's grove for the day's abiding. Having plunged into the blind men's grove, she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the Bikuni Soma, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse, saying, That state, so hard to achieve, which is to be attained by the seers, cannot be attained by a woman with her two-fingered wisdom. <clears throat> okay, so before we find out the answer, let's hear. So the one thing that I want you to know or notice is that Alavika was seeking seclusion. It was about being alone in the woods in that way. And Mara's taunting was like, what are you trying to find out here in your seclusion? You should go back to the world and have fun. So it was about trying to disrupt Alavika from being alone in the woods, from her seclusion. Soma has gone to the same blind men's grove. And I was, um, I was working on a translation of the Chinese version of this. And interestingly, the Chinese does say specifically that she'd gone to the woods to do Zen, which is to say dhyana, specifically dhyana meditation. But the point is, is that it's not about the seclusion. It's about that she's trying to meditate. She's getting into this meditative concentration. And along comes Mara saying, you know, the great seers, that's the state of being that the great seers are trying to get into. It can't be achieved by a woman. What are you doing? And then just a note, the last part of this is the line about it cannot be attained by a woman with her two-fingered wisdom. I read that, you know, there's a footnote on that. I was reading another essay about this two-fingered wisdom. It's definitely, it's clearly, everybody agrees that it's sort of a, um, a euphemism, a somewhat derogatory term for a woman, and it has something to do with domesticity. One interpretation I read was that it was the two fingers was about like one finger in the baby's mouth and one finger in the soup. So it was about like, your place is raising children and cooking. There's another one about that when you measure rice, you put two fingers in to see how far the rice should come up. Either way, all of the references about two-fingered wisdom, they seem to point to domesticity. So the wisdom of a householder or the wisdom of a housewife in that way. So Mara taunting Soma is saying that this the state of meditation, the state of dhyana, it can't be attained by a woman with her basic domestic knowledge in that way.
But then <laughs> it occurred to the Bhikkhuni Soma. Now, who is this that recited the verse? A human being? A non-human being? Then it occurred to her, this is Mara, the evil one, who has recited this verse desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in me, desiring to make me fall away from concentration. Then the bhikkhuni Soma, having understood, this is Mara, the evil one, replied to him in verse saying, what does womanhood matter at all when the mind is well concentrated? When knowledge flows on steadily and one sees correctly into Dharma, one to whom it might occur, I'm a woman, or I'm a man, or I'm anything at all. That person is fit for Mara to address. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing the Bhikkhuni Soma knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. <laughs> okay. So interestingly, this also has connection to a lot of ideas that we were talking about last week. So if you were here for Dharma Doors last week, Allow me to kind of reiterate a basic point that I was trying to make last time, and then we'll dive into how it applies to the sutta. So last week, in response to the Samidhi Sutta, I was talking about the construction of identity. And in particular, what I was talking about was the appropriation or identification with different things. Different things like name, associating or identifying with one's name, identifying with one's occupation, identifying with one's marital status, identifying with a bunch of things. And what I was getting at last week, if you'll recall, if you were here, I was getting at how the mind, as the Buddha, as Buddhism is always telling us, the mind in its normal default mode functions very dualistically. And part of what that is, is, is that take, for example, the idea of being married. So we can, and say for me, I do, identify as being a married person. And the idea is, is that I could get divorced and then I would identify as being single. And what I was talking about last week is, is that we kind of have these two categories. They are dualistic categories. You, one, is either single or married. And what I was getting at last week is, could, can we imagine not playing that game at all? Meaning not identifying as either single or married. And it kind of challenges a lot of ideas because there's almost this sense in which, no, 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 no. You, you don't get to decide that. <laughs> you're, you, you, you are placed in categories. And you are either wed and therefore married, or you're not, and therefore you're single. That's kind of it. <laughs> but what we want to notice is, is no, that's not it. <laughs> you, you don't need to identify with either of those. But notice that we can and we often do. There might be, well, look at it this way, or think about it this way. There might be some other planet where there's options that you don't even know about. And what I mean is, is like options for interpersonal relationships. There could be options you don't even know about, but are you identifying with those options or not? 
you don't even know about them. So you're not even participating in them. You could have the same relationship to these conventional ideas of marriage and singleness too, which is that they don't really exist at all and are therefore not really important. Or you could think that they are very important, which many people do think they are very important. I just want to point out, I think the Buddha would like to point out, it is very much an option to think that they're very important or not. <laughs> Some people think they are very, 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 very important. Some people think they're not so important. And it might be possible to just not entertain those ideas at all is what we're getting at. Now, that's something like marriage. But what, you know, last week I talked about a number of different things. But it was all, all of it, whether I was talking about identifying with your occupation, identifying with this or that, it was all to talk about how enlightenment, for lack of a better term, wisdom, in the Buddhist tradition, the way that I understand it, it is about not identifying, not appropriating anything. Not identifying as Michael, not identifying as Michael or a teacher, not identifying as married or single, and as Soma is talking about, not even identifying as male or female, either. And then, of course, what her poem says is interesting, which is that anybody, one to whom it might occur, I'm a man, I'm a woman, or I'm anything at all. That person is fit for Mara to talk to. In other words, Soma gave Mara the hand and said, talk to the hand because <laughs> you ain't talking to me in that way. So Soma's kind of uh, took it all the way there, which is this very powerful statement about for an enlightened being, an arhat, they're not playing either of those games. Actually, male, female, or anything at all. So that then it is what constitutes or would seem to constitute the enlightened state of an arhat, that state of not identifying. A couple of things about that really quickly. Along, while we're thinking about this, like while we're talking about this and maybe while you're thinking about this, I wanna, I wanna draw a connection to a really important Buddhist idea. It's not really in our sutra, but I wanna use this opportunity. So what it is is I want you to think about, let's pretend for the moment Pretend that there's no appropriation or identification going on, meaning that you are not staked in being married or single. You are not staked in being American or not American, meaning like foreign or not. You're just not even playing that game at all. You're not staked in being this or that. You're not staked in this or that. So just go all the way down the line to total non-identification. I want you to think about, does someone in that state of being, could they get into an argument about something? What side would they take? My point is, is that we want to think about, it's a very important Buddhist idea, and it's to think about the relationship to attachment to views, attachment to these kind of strong opinions about things, about a lot of things. And what I want you to kind of think about is how, if you were really in such a mode of not clinging to anything, 
in that way. Could you get worked up about something? <laughs> or does it require that identification with being a blank, whatever it is? Do you need to have that identification? And then you could get worked up about it. You could get excited about whatever. For example, let's take something like super chill, super low key. Let's say I identified as a, uh, I, I don't even really know sports teams in that way, but you know, identified as a 49ers fan. Like, so now I'm identified as that. I want you to notice how I could really start getting worked up about a lot of different things when I'm invested in that. Meaning, we won, we lost, your team sucks, our team's awesome. So identifying as a 49er fan then allows for all of these kind of other possibilities. But what I want you to know, or just think about, think about somebody that doesn't identify with any of the teams. In fact, doesn't even watch the sport, couldn't care less about the sport. If the 49ers win or lose, how does that affect our person who's not identified as a 49? They're not identified with it at all. Notice, notice the wonderful emotional equilibrium of that person who is not invested in that. And that's just the idea of being like a sports fan of this or that team in that way. Now, I'm not talking anything negative against being a sports fan, but I am talking about the problems of identifying and attaching too much, which is that it could bring about this emotional, these emotional things. Versus again, noticing that if you don't have a, uh, what's the expression, a, a, a dog in the race or a pony in the race or whatever, if you don't have any investment in it, notice how totally neutral you are to the outcome. <laughs> well, that wonderful emotional equilibrium that's super chill and not worked up about things, it could keep going and keep going and keep going. To the point where if you were actually totally an arhat, non-identified, non-appropriating, there's nothing to get worked up about at all. It's total emotional balance in that way. That's the idea. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. Well, I have a lot more to say about Soma, but anybody, anything come up from this poem and this idea? Hmm. Noe. Uh, so begs the question. I even calling myself a Buddhist. Hmm. Sure. Or, or, or a school or a type of Buddhist or what what part of Buddhist. And, and I believe I've read that we've talked about it here. Let it go. The Buddha even said, doesn't it let it go? Mm -hmm. And and in the Mahayana. Let's be clear, in the Mahayana, they even talk about the Bodhisattva taking on the appearance of a Brahmin, of a Jain. In modern times, we would say as a Christian, as a Muslim, to, and because of not having that over-identification with, no, I'm a Buddhist. I can't be identified as a Christian because I'm a Buddhist, versus this very you know, much more easygoing idea of like, oh, we're going to church. I guess I'm Christian today. In that sense of like, okay, let's go. And again, notice that if you have that relationship, which is this non-clinging uh, relationship to it, yeah, let's go to church. Let's go to mosque. Let's go. But if I'm overly invested in being this religion, Oh, now all of a sudden I can't go in that building. That building's off limits because I'm this kind of person. So we want to just, again, from a Buddhist point of view, we just want to notice the ramifications of 
these more subtle aspects of clinging or what we're calling identifying or appropriating in that way. Okay, so a couple more things, and I think, yeah, a couple more things about Soma. So one of the things that I want to kind of draw our attention to, because I just think it's so cool, I just think these, these sutras are so interesting. I, I want us to think about, like, like what's what's going on here with with these sutras? Like what's going on here with Mara coming and like taunting these women? What's up with that, right? And the way that I read it, the way that I hear it, is that it is about someone, Alavika, Soma, whoever, but it's about someone going off alone into the woods and potentially being afraid of that, feeling vulnerable, feeling scared, feeling threatened. And that fear, that fear when you're in the woods and you're alone and that fear, that's Mara. And the idea is, is that Mara is that little voice telling you, you better get out of here, protect yourself, get out of here. And then the Arahat, Alavika, says, what, what, who is that? What is that voice that's telling me I should go back to the kitchen? What's that voice telling me I should go back to the world? That's Mara. And then reciting or making this statement this very powerful statement about you don't you don't have anything on me mara and then at the end what is the refrain <laughs> mara gets sad and disappointed and disappears well i take that to mean that the fear is gone mara's disappeared in that way so i think that these i find these these particular sutras very powerful I find them very, very strong in that sense. So just kind of want to emphasize the way that I'm kind of reading these in that way. Oh, by the way, yeah, oh, no. Yeah, I was going to ask something earlier, but since you came back to it, I think I will ask. Um, I, I, I have heard or understood Mara to be like a personification of the hindrances or, you know, that the two are different ways of thinking about the same thing is that is that how you teach it or i could <laughs> if, if you'd like me to now um one thing that we you should we should be aware about regarding mara so this is a quick little um subsection about mara so you should be aware that there's sort of i would say i i would suggest that there is the Hinayana early Buddhist understanding of Mara. There is the more mainstream Mahayana understanding of Mara. And there's a Vajrayana, a sort of third turning of the wheel understanding of Mara. And Noam, what you're referencing sort of sounds to me like the Vajrayana. And I'll tell you why. Quickly, in the Hinayana, there's only one Mara seemingly, and it is this, it, it, the Mara that is appearing in these sutras is the Mara that we see in the early sutras. It is the voice of temptation, again, taunting the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, trying to get the Buddha to break his concentration and all of that. So there's that Mara. In the Mahayana, things get wild because there is that Mara, but in the Mahayana, they, they do this interesting thing where Mara is actually kind of a secret bodhisattva and is secretly kind of helping us all out by making us afraid and getting us to advance our practice. So Mara is kind of a, a good guy. Interestingly, it's like a little twist, in, in, in which is leave it to the Mahayana to kind of turn things on their head like that. That idea, though, 
then gets sort of morphed into the Vajrayana idea where there are four Maras. And in the world of Vajrayana, one Mara is death. And that sort of corresponds to the Mara that we've been talking about tonight, just utterly the personification of death. But then there is the Mara of the Kleshas, the Mara of the Afflictions. And then there's the Mara of the Skandhas. That's the third. And then the fourth Mara is Mara Deva Putra, Mara the Godling. And this is a version of Mara that exists in the afterlife. And it's a Mara that is sort of, it's kind of, I, in my estimation, it comes from that Mahayana idea where Mara is kind of secretly a bodhisattva good guy. Mara Deva Putra is the idea of Mara the Godling, who is kind of a good guy in that way but only encountered sort of after death, whereas the Mara of this realm is the death version. But then what happens with the, oh, this will be an interesting aside, by the way. What happens in the Vajrayana is that they start to identify our own greed, our own anger, and our own delusion, the three poisons or the three kleshas, those are the Mara within, whereas the first Mara that means death is considered to be like an external being that you could like have a conversation with. Whereas the three Kleshas are this like idea that we are infected with Mara. We are poisoned by Mara. But then what's really wild is the third version of Mara is the Mara that is the five skandhas. In other words, you are Mara in terms of the five skandhas, which is why if you identify and cling to the five skandhas as self, Mara's gotcha. But if you're like an arhat and you're not identifying with the body, Mara doesn't have you in that sense. Now, one of the things that I just want you to know, just a quick aside again, Mara, whose name means death and is this kind of boogeyman, this personification of, of that, Mara is often just translated as a demon. And then what happens is, is that there develops in the Vajrayana a practice of working with your afflictions and working with your skandhas or yeah, working with your aggregates. And that practice becomes known as feeding your maras, otherwise known as feeding your demons. So an interesting kind of aside is that the popular practice, which I know goes on at SFDC of feeding your demons, the demon is mara. And part of the practice, as I understand it, there's a lot of versions of that practice, but it is about making peace with Mara that is inside you in that way. And so by being nice to Mara rather than mean and making offerings and sort of feeding Mara in that sense, it's a, it's a practice in the Vajrayana. So regardless, that's, a, that's my, the end of my quick aside about Mara. <laughs> Okay, so let's ah really quickly my last uh, one last quick thing about Soma. So her the first stanza of her poem. What does womanhood matter at all, when the mind is concentrated well? When knowledge flows on steadily as one sees correctly into Dhamma or into the Dharma, into things, sees correctly into things. The phrase seeing correctly into things, that is Vipassana. 
That is insight, to see correctly into phenomena. So again, I just wanted to point out that in both of these poems, there are references to the status of the nun as an arhat who has had either the pranya or the insight. Now, really quickly, I mentioned at the beginning the Therigatha. I also always, always like to recommend this book, which is an alternate translation, a very modern interpretive translation of these poems called The First Free Women. So this is a translation of this, which again is also found in this book. So these are three different translations of the same book. Soma has a poem in the Therigatha. But <laughs> let me read it to you. Where'd we go? So this is Soma. He said, it is hard to get to the place that sages want to reach. It's not possible for a woman, especially not one with only two fingers worth of wisdom. So Ma replied, what does being a woman have to do with it? What counts is that the heart is settled and that one sees what really is. What you take as pleasures are not for me. The mass of mental darkness is split open. Know this, evil one, you are defeated. You are finished. Sound familiar? <laughs> it's because it's the same poem. So the same poem is, you know, translated differently in all three of these, but it shows you kind of what I was also talking about last week, where we have what is known as a gatha. A gatha is a poem. It's in a certain meter, a certain rhyme scheme. So it's a, a poetic verse. And it would seem, if you asked me, I, I would say, I think so. It would seem that there was a bhikkhuni, a nun, named Soma, who composed a gatha. And that gatha, we've read it a few times tonight. If you ask me as like a historian scholar person, I would say that that gatha, that poem that was thought of and spoken and recited by this woman Soma, I would say that that gatha then gets put into a sutra, put into a collection of poems. In other words, the sutra might be and probably is a literary creation. But the actual poem, I would believe that it goes back to the days of the Buddha and back to the actual woman Soma. And if that's true, which again, I don't, we don't really have any reason to think it's not true, then it's very remarkable, in my opinion, that a 2,500 year old poem has made it this far. I mean, all of these things are remarkable, but I don't know. These these poems and these sutras are super special for me. I don't know. I just really like them. In fact, I like them so much. We're going to do another one. So <clears throat> I'm going to do the next one, which is the uh, Gotami Sutta. This is also known as Kisha Gotami because there's another nun called Gotami. This is not that nun. This is a different nun. This is Kisha Gotami. A quick backstory, and you need to know this backstory about Kisha Gotami. So this is a this is a powerful story. You might have heard this story before, but this this is a story that uh, like it kind of brings me to tears almost every time that I I hear it, and so. Kisha Gotami, before becoming a nun, before renouncing, before becoming a Buddhist, was married and had a child, had a son. 
Unfortunately, the child, her son, died while young. But what happened was, is that Gotami was so struck with grief that she refused to believe that her son was dead. And so she carried around the corpse looking for somebody who could bring the child back to life. And she went to all the wise men in the forest searching for somebody that could bring her son back to life. Such a sad story. It's like devastating. Somebody eventually says, oh, you should go see the Buddha. The Buddha can help. And so she goes to the Buddha, tells her about her son, and the Buddha says, oh, yeah, I can, I can help. I'll make a medicine, and it'll bring him back to life. I just need you to go door to door, and I need you to find a mustard seed from a family that has not experienced death. Bring me the mustard seed and I'll make this special elixir for you. It'll cure everything. So Gautami gets all excited because she thinks, oh, the Buddha is going to bring my son back to life. So she starts going door to door. And of course, one after the next, she cannot find a home. In fact, what she winds up hearing is all of the death that house has experienced. And then she goes to the next house and they tell her all the deaths that have experienced at that house. And during that moment, she became enlightened. She realized and she renounced right then and there. And she realized not only, and this, this is the really beautiful thing about the story, not only did she realize what the Buddha was saying, like what the Buddha's teaching was, which is that she is not rare for having lost her child. In fact, it unfortunately happens all too often in that way. So she realized, oh, I'm not alone in this. And in fact, other households have suffered even worse. But the story is, not only did she realize what the Buddha's teaching was, she realized the upaya that the Buddha had performed, which is that he had made basically this promise, but he knew that this going around door to door would get her to see what she needed to see. And so it's this twofold realization about one, that she's not alone in experiencing death. But two, that the way the Buddha taught her was miraculous because it wasn't something that he could tell her in that way. Beautiful story. Oft, it's often retold about going door to door searching for the mustard seed from a family that hasn't experienced death. So that's the story of Gotami. And again, she became enlightened. She is an arhat. And so at Shravasti, then in the morning, the bhikkhuni Kisha Gotami, dressed and taking bowl and robe, entered Shravasti for alms. When she had walked for alms in Shravasti and had returned from her alms round, after her meal, she went to the blind men's grove for the day's abiding. Having plunged into the blind men's grove, she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the bhikkhuni Kisha Gotami, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse, saying, Why now, when your son is dead? Why do you sit alone with a tearful face? Having entered the woods all alone, are you on the lookout for a man? Then it occurred to the Bhikkhuni Kishigotami. Now, who is this that recited that verse? A human being? A non human being? Then it occurred to her this is Mara, the evil one 
who has recited this verse, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in me, desiring to make me fall away from concentration. Then Bikuni Kisha Gotami, having understood, this is Mara the evil one, replied to him in verse saying, I've gotten past the death of sons. With this, the search for men has ended. I do not sorrow. I do not weep. Nor do I fear you, friend. Delight everywhere has been destroyed. The mass of darkness has been sundered. Having conquered the army of death, I dwell without defiling taints. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing that Bikuni Kishigotami knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. All right. So very related, of course. We have a slightly different emphasis this time. So the first poem was about being in seclusion. The second poem was about sort of meditation, but in particular, it was this idea about a woman can't achieve this, right? The third of these, uh, Gotami here, there's a law, it's basically seemingly about kind of sexuality in that way, and about this kind of idea of looking for a man. Like, what are you doing in the woods? Are you looking for a man in here? So it's sort of similar to Soma's encounter with Mara, where Mara is basically like, what are you doing in the woods? This is a place for men to do enlightenment. Women aren't supposed to be doing this. So it's kind of a similar idea, a similar topic. But let's focus on, let's see. So yeah, I mean, let's just focus on the whole poem or her whole poem. So I've gotten past the death of sons. That's a reference to the story I just told you about her backstory. With this, the search for men has ended. I do not sorrow, I do not weep, nor do I fear you, friend. And then delight everywhere has been destroyed, the mass of darkness has been sundered. So we're sort of dealing with the same idea, which is that desire for the things of the world, in this case, the desire for a spouse or a man in that way, has been overcome. And that's what causes this... Um, state of liberation that Gotami is in. We often hear, or yeah, we often hear, we often read the phrase, conquering the army of Mara. Here it's translated literally as conquering the armies of death. But remember, Mara means death in that way. And then the last line of the poem, I dwell without defiling taints. And that, of course, is the name of the Buddhist game, which is to say that the mind is tainted with greed, anger, and delusion. This is also the language of the three poisons. We are The mind is poisoned, the mind is tainted, the mind is stained. All of these, all of these are analogies, of course, and an analogy of being stained, an analogy of being poisoned. But for me, a very important aspect of the, of the metaphors about either being tainted or being stained, or, or in that way being poisoned, the most important part about that for me is that it says that these three afflictions, these three primary taints, this, these three primary problems, are not endemic to our being, which is to say that they are not an essential necessary part of our functioning. They are poisons. They are stains. And we could clear out the stain. We could extract the poison. So in other words, 
there is a way of being in the world without these taints or without these afflictions in that way. Now, by the way, there are the taints. The taints are actually kind of a special category within the world of Buddhism. They talk about being kind of tainted with these varying desires. One of the big ones, which is an interesting one, is it's being tainted with the desire for existence. And this is a really, really delicate one because, of course, what the Buddha is always talking about in terms of the middle path, if you've read a lot of the early suttas, you'll be familiar with the language of a middle path that avoids the extremes of self-gratification and self-mortification. So those are these kind of two extreme paths, and they are sort of um, represented in the life story of the Buddha during his life as a prince, living in a palace, having anything and everything he ever wanted. Siddhartha, the Buddha, experienced self-gratification to the umpteenth degree. But then when he renounces and he goes off into the woods, he starts practicing the austerities, things like fasting, not sleeping, not sitting down for long periods of time, not standing up for long periods of time, hanging upside down from trees for long periods of time, all kinds of self-mortifying activity. And that was because at the time of the Buddha, there was a whole group of renunciants that were out in the woods. And what they were trying to do was overcome the body. Like a form of mastery over the body where I could walk over hot coals and it doesn't bother me. I could, again, starve myself for months doesn't bother me. So there was a tradition that the Buddha or Siddhartha was exposed to of what is called self-mortification practices. Then the Buddha, having lived in the palace, having practiced the austerities, that's when he comes to this idea of the middle path, which avoids self-gratification and self-mortification in that way. So there's always this sort of um, is this emphasis in Buddhism about not going to the extreme of wanting the body to be destroyed, <clears throat> excuse me, in that sense. So one of the taints is this desire for existence. But the opposite of that is not a desire for non-existence, is what I'm getting at. One of the taints is this desperation of living. And we've all kind of got it to a certain degree. And it, you know, it usually comes out when we're scared in that way. But the idea is, is that someone like Gotami here, who claims to say and says that she's dwelling without being defiled by the taints, the taints, one of them being this desire for existence in that way. We also, I want to just add this to something I was saying earlier. When I was talking about not identifying, not identifying as a sports fan of this, of this sort or that sort, not identifying with this or that, remember I pointed and I, I wanted to say, and I did say, what could make that person upset if they don't have any identification with anything in particular in that way? What could cause them mental distress in that sense, right? Well, along the same lines, early Buddhism is much more 
it emphasizes a lot more this idea of kind of overcoming that desperate desire for existence <clears throat> in order to not be afraid of dying, in order to not be afraid of death. And again, it's not that you, if you don't crave existence, it's not that you crave non-existence. No, 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 no. We are talking about this non-attachment to that any which way, one way or the other. Now, one of the things that I want to use the last couple of minutes here to kind of really emphasize, I want to emphasize this. Actually, I don't want to, it's not so much emphasizing as I want to clarify something really important. The way that I understand Buddhism, the way that I practice Buddhism, the way that I teach it, I am very aware that there is a very high possibility for repression in Buddhism. And what I mean by that is when I tell you that it is a taint, it is considered a taint within the world of Buddhism to desire existence. You might hear that as don't desire existence. And that if you do, shame on you, like bad for you, right? But that's not really what's going on here. And I, again, I would never teach, practice, or even think about Buddhism as wanting to repress anything like that. So rather, what we would want to do is through a path of wisdom, we would want to come to an understanding of, or we would want to come to an understanding by which we would not crave or desire existence. We just wouldn't in that way. And the point is, this idea of this like, taint that what they're calling a taint of a desire for existence in that way we want to basically do a a little bit of kind of deep dharma thinking and it's this deep dharma thinking about what what exists that I'm afraid of going out of existence. Like, what, what is that? And when we start to look at it, the idea is, is like, well, me. <laughs> I'm afraid of me going out of existence. That's what I don't want to go out of existence is me. And if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, at all lately, we've been talking about this idea of me, this idea of the self. And so, uh, so much of the work that we do in Dharma doors and so much of the work that is about that Buddhism is about is it is about looking at the nature of the self, looking at the nature of what I think is me. And the idea here is, is that we have a certain notion about ourselves as an existent being. And then because of that, we can have this idea of, oh, that time or the day when I won't exist, thus clinging to a de this desire for existence. But what what the Dharma is about is looking at that very idea of self. And as you know, or as I, you probably know, it's about realizing that that very self is nowhere to be found. It's an idea to be sure. But once you go looking for it, once you go exploring and actually trying to find this self of yours that you are, it actually becomes very, very hard to find. And this, of course, is what the Buddha realized. And this is why the big realization in Buddhism is, oh, there just isn't that 
self in that way. What I'm getting at, of course, is that if one really has a realization of no self, one realizes, oh, I don't exist in the way that I thought I existed anyways. And therefore, you would ultimately realize the existence of a self is the product of the craving and clinging. That it is an actual product of that. In other words, it's an idea that comes about from the clinging and the craving in that way. And so if when one isn't clinging in the way that we've been talking about all night tonight, the idea of not identifying with these different things and therefore ultimately not getting worked up about them, but then ultimately not even having that particular kind of self-identity that then is thinking about itself as a currently existing thing. What I'm getting at, by the way, if, if, if I'm not making this super clear, let me try to make it a little clearer. Actually, I'll try to make it super duper clear. In the world of Buddhism, there's an understanding that mind, like not, not consciousness exactly, but mind, you know, like this, this that's experiencing this right now, you know, mind. In Buddhism, there's a kind of tacit understanding that mind isn't a thing. It's not a thing that is locatable anywhere. I know that we have this idea that it is somehow between the ears and behind the eyes, but for Buddhism, the mind, mind is not located anywhere because it isn't a thing, but mind can think about itself as a thing. It's a confusion, it's a delusion. But as soon as mind starts thinking about itself in that way as something, it's going to start trying to figure out then where that something is. And that's where we get the idea of, <clears throat> I'm not this, I'm not this. I must be this. And so there, the mind clings. It's an aspect of mind. It's clingy. It's like Velcro. It likes to go around sticking to things. And so mind sticks to the aggregates. It's why, the, it's why one of the Maras is the aggregates, because mind can identify with and as body. It's a problem of mind to do that because then mind thinks it's this. And when mind thinks it's this, it gets afraid. <laughs> it gets afraid because it's like, but I'm, wat I'm watching this. I'm watching this fall apart every day. I'm watching this fall apart. And therefore, I'm going to fall apart one day, and I'm going to eventually not exist one day. But guess what? Only things that exist cannot exist. Mind that isn't a thing, it already doesn't exist. So it is in no danger of going out of existence. But notice what happens when mind forgets that it isn't a thing and again starts to lob on and can like identify with the body. But that's why if you go back to last week, we talked about it. We sort of talk about it almost every week. Mind can 
identify and associate with the body, but it doesn't need to. And what I mean by that is, is that we often, it's what we talked about last week. The mind says, I have hands. I am wearing a green shirt. That starts to sound like the I or the mind is wearing a green shirt. And therefore, mind is a thing with a green shirt on. Is mind something with a green shirt on? Notice that you can think about it that way, and that turns mind into an object that's wearing a green shirt, and that's located somewhere. But is mind wearing a green shirt? I don't think it necessarily has to be understood that way. <laughs> And when one is in more of the mode that our wonderful nuns are in that we've been reading about, where they're in that free, liberated, emancipated mode of not identifying with any of these things, and they are fearless. So that's my, my grand conclusion for tonight. All of these poems have been about fearlessness fearless women i'm here for it so <laughs> all right i think i'm going to read some more of these next week because i really like these and there's only a few so more bikunis uh bikuni suttas to come any last comments questions ideas about our lovely yeah no i have a question about mind not being a thing how does that um uh, uh, swear them before, like, how does how is that true? And, and yet, it's also a sense organ. Oh no, no, no! <clears throat> the eyeballs are something. Seeing is seeing something, right? But but so there are six. Organs and the sixth one is the mind that has thoughts. Thoughts aren't things, but the mind is a thing. Well, no, no. I just asked you, is seeing a thing? No. The brain is a thing. So, mind is like seeing. But people often talk, say mind instead of brain. So that is that the confusion you're saying? That is the brain? confusion because we need to understand in Buddhism there are the six organs. Right the six corresponding objects, right, and then the six consciousnesses. And right. I'm actually not even talking about consciousness. I'm talking about mind. So is so the brain is the organ and it's and its object is mind or it's object Dharmas. Oh, the object dharma. of the the object of the mental faculty are dharmas. So then where is mind? Mind in that is schema. In this schema? Yeah, in the six organ schema. Mind is. <laughs> this is where it gets tricky. <laughs> so, you, uh, you know how in a dream. <laughs> <Got one minute. laughs> you know how in a dream. There's like the mind. Meaning that there's the experiencer and the thinker. Yeah. But. In that dream, that mind is confused and thinks it has a body with sensory organs that's experiencing objects. When mind is confused and is dividing experience into six sense media, that's what we call consciousness, vijnana. Yeah. Vijnana is always operating in terms of subject, object, and in terms of six types of sense media. Mind is the experiencer of that. And mind can be deluded, confused, unenlightened, and operating in terms of consciousnesses, where it's like, ooh, look at that. Did you hear that? Versus mind which is not 
under the impression of subject object that is not under the impression that sense media is six kinds of sense media. And that is more what we would call the enlightened mind versus the deluded mind that functions in terms of consciousness. No? <laughs> um, thank you, Michael. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that one. Um, and we'll do more of this next week. We'll do I more mean, good. <laughs>